morning, church. Good to be with you and worship with you this morning. Welcome to those who are visiting with us and pray that your time here with us today will be profitable and that you will be a minister to. Uh, a, couple of re- a couple of reminders from the uh, bulletin today. Uh, first of all, following our meeting, the deacons are reminded that they will be meeting downstairs in the basement. Um, the community meal is on Tuesday night. I saw the clipboard working its way through the congregation. Make sure it gets through to everyone uh, on that, and um, that would be a good thing. Uh, the community meal, if you want to come and check it out, we encourage you to do that. If you'd like to help with that, let the deacons know, and they can always uh, plug you in somewhere in that process. Uh, on Tuesday evening also, following that at 7 o'clock, just a reminder that the Finance Committee is supposed to meet. Uh, the Finance Committee is supposed to meet on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. <coughs> Next week is a big week. It's we, the week we kick off our uh, uh, everything, choir, the Sunday school, uh, all of that stuff. And so note in your bulletin the various times that things will happen. Following the service next week, we are planning on having a potluck together. Uh, You are encouraged to bring a dish, some dish, main dish, side dish, salad dish, double dessert dish, (laughs) whatever, all right? And uh, we'll have a meal together after the service, and uh, we are looking forward to that. Um, If you would like to help with that, they are trying to get uh, kind of a, a, a feel for who can do what. There's a sign-up sheet over on the table if you can help set up or help tear down or, or whatever. Uh, would you see the sheet and sign up so the people in charge of that kind of know who and what they have to work with? You'll notice that there's also some other things. We'll announce those next week that are a little further out, like the Bible study and Moonlighters and uh, Prime Timers and all of that other stuff. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this week? Would you please stand and join in praising the name of Jesus? worship this morning comes from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Let us pray together. O oh God, you are infinite eternal and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. Your works everywhere praise you, and your glory is revealed in all the earth. We come before you with hearts of thanks and with our voices singing, knowing that you are our God and we are your people. Amen.
Even as we choose to go our own way, God's grace calls us back. God is present and seeks to bring healing and wholeness to all. Therefore, I invite you into a time of personal reflection and corporate confession before God and one another. God of grace and glory, we know that we are creatures prone to pride and arrogance. We often think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We are safest and most content when we are allowed to fashion the world around us as we think it should be. We try to control life and often try to control others in order to feel happy and secure. We try to act as though we are God. We only seem to need you when times are tough or personal heartaches arise or physical weaknesses overwhelm us or the consequences of our failures and fears cause us turmoil. Forgive us for failing to lean on you, trust you, worship you, and love you as God. Forgive us for failing to glorify you and enjoy you in every area of our life. Reveal yourself as the Most High God who not only creates and sustains all things, but who also holds us within heaven's embrace. Renew our trust in you, strengthen our dependence upon you, heighten our awareness of you, and deepen our love and reverence for you. These things we pray in the name of our glorious Savior, Jesus. Amen. And now let us bring our confessions to him. Amen. Jesus Christ brought humanity the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. We stand reconciled to God. Safely reconciled to the God who created you and knew you from the foundations of the earth, know that you are no longer children of darkness, but instead children of light. Walk, therefore, as children of light. As children of the light, walk in love towards one another and be at peace. Let us share God's peace with others. friendly group this morning. <laughs> Sounds like we should have a meal together next Sunday. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. They are words of life. They are evidence of things written down for us traditions that have been passed from one generation to another. 
showing us how to live, showing us what to believe, showing us who you are. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand the things that you have for us this day through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today comes to us from Daniel chapter 4. Follow along with me. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. And I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came, and they, I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom the spirit of the holy gods dwelt. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the vision of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the ends of the whole world. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of heaven lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. And he proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it, and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the words of the Holy One, to the end that the living may know that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the dream, the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is within you. <clears throat> well, we are working our way through the book of Daniel. The first six chapters have three tales, three what we call hero tales. We've done two of those so far. And it has three dreams or three visions that the kings have that Daniel is called to be a part of. So there are three tales and three dreams. And the message that all of them convey is very, very similar. The first dream that we saw a couple of weeks ago, Nebuchadnezzar forgot the dream. He didn't know what it was and he required of his wise men and ultimately of Daniel to tell him what the dream was and then to help him understand it. Today's dream that he has is a little bit different. The purpose of the dream stories in the book of Daniel is to do something for the people of Israel. Again, I point out this image to you. It is an image of, Bab or of Babylon conquering Jerusalem, conquering the temple. This is the mayhem, the chaos, the confusion that is following as people lose their lives and as the walls of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem are, are destroyed by the invading army. And then the best and the brightest are taken off into captivity into the land of Babylon. 
Much like we see in the news today, I must have gotten 20 headlines this morning of all of the refugees fleeing the war-torn areas of the Mideast, trying to find a place of refuge, a place of safety for their family. These people were displaced. And the book of Daniel follows in particular four of those people, the best and the brightest. So the dream that is being told, you have to ask yourself this question. Why, of all of the things that happen, all of the events, why are there three tales of heroes and three dreams recorded for us? Certainly there was more going on than that. And sometimes I ask myself the question when I'm watching the news. Why are those stories being reported? There are literally thousands of things that could be reported every day. But somebody makes a decision that these six or these eight or these 12 stories are the stories that you need to know so that you can understand what's going on in the world around you. I'm not sure they do a good job with that, but the idea is that out of everything that happens, here are the things you need to know. So we arrive today, the story of another dream. The purpose of the dream stories is very interesting. To a group of people who've been displaced, rooted from their homes, and placed into a land of exile, the dream stories always have a consistent message. One, God still rules and governs the affairs of this world. The people needed to know that. They could know that dwelling in the security of their own land, but to know that in the midst of a strange land, strange environment in which everything has been uprooted, they needed to know that God still governs the affairs of this world and God still knows everything. There's nothing hidden from you. So the dream stories always reinforce those two themes. It also tells us that faithfulness to God still leads to a blessing. One of the things we find out in our story today is that Daniel, who was a relative unknown, an exile early in his training in the first dream story, now in this dream story has been promoted to the chief of the magicians. Daniel is the one who is looked to. He went from somebody not even known and who is in fear of his life to now being the person that is looked to to solve the mystery. Faithfulness to God still leads to blessing and still leads to favor. Do you think maybe God's people need to know that? Do you think we need to know that? The dream stories also tell us that the heathen, the ungodly, the unbelievers, ultimately confess to the greatness of Israel's God. In all of the dream stories, ultimately the leader has some sense that God is much, much bigger than what he ever dreamed, that they ever dreamed. That the heathen ultimately confess that Israel's God is the great God. And if Israel's God is the great God, then Israel must be the favored people. And finally, if the heathen know and confess God's greatness, then it is doubly imperative that God's people, Israel knows and confesses. So the idea is, if the heathen ultimately will get there, then you, Israel, you need to be faithful to that all the time. There's a somber message in all of that. If we are less than Nebuchadnezzar, and that is true because Nebuchadnezzar conquered us, if Nebuchadnezzar is, let me word it this way, if Nebuchadnezzar is greater than we are, and God proves to be greater than Nebuchadnezzar, then where we are and what we are suffering ultimately has to go back to being the will of God. There's nothing left to sense of chance or fortune. This is a story, like all of the stories, that point Israel back to God and say, God, if we are here because you as the Most High God have us here, what is it that you want us to know? What is it that you want us to do? So our story today is once again about this King Nebuchadnezzar. 
There's a decree at the beginning that we didn't read. Nebuchadnezzar issues it as a universal decree. It goes out over all the lands and people, signifying the scope of how great he is. And the decree declares that the God of Israel is the Most High God. He is the God above all gods and the King above all kings. And that he is to be worshipped. Then that moves into the story that we read for you. The account begins that Nebuchadnezzar is dwelling in the midst of peace and prosperity. I always love that. Peace and happiness. Everything in life is going good. Life is wonderful. Life is good. He's enjoying the fruits of being king. He's in his palace enjoying all of the fruits of being the world's greatest and most feared person. And in the midst of that peace and happiness, he suddenly has a dream. There is a circumstance that comes into that world and shatters his sense of peace and happiness. I think you probably have been there. I know I have. Sometimes I go along in life and things are going so good for so long, I look and say, I better be careful, something's coming. Can't be this good all the time. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had this thing coming and it is in the way of a dream. The dream is so powerful that the scriptures say that he awakens and he still sees it. This is not a dream that he's forgotten. This is a dream that he is in the middle of and it terrifies him. He's aware of the dream and the images from it continue to play upon his mind. So he offers the details of the dream, unlike the last one, to the Chaldeans, the group of magicians and astrologers and sorcerers, those who were looked to to take the things of the unknown and unseen world and bring it into the seen world to help understand what's going on in it. He was looking to the sciences, the, the, the weird science part of the of, of, of our existence, always looking to that which is unknown to provide meaning for what we see and hear. Nebuchadnezzar summons them all to the palace, tells them the dream, and they don't understand what it means. And so now Daniel is called before him, the one who was unknown in our last episode of the dream, now the chief among all of the king's magi. There's a dream. The dream is of a tree. The tree once stood tall. The images of it spanning to heaven, spreading out over all of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful. Its branches were abundant. The fruit on it was amazing. The beasts of the field took refuge under it. Birds camped in it. It was the life spring or the centerpiece of all existence. And then an angel came down and said, cut the tree down. Cut it off. Lop off all of its branches. Remove from it all of its leaves. Scatter from it all of its fruit. Send the beasts running away from it. Send the birds of the air flying somewhere else. The worker that comes from heaven, the angel, declares that every part of this tree's beauty and existence and stature and greatness is about to be removed from it. And then the angel declares that there are seven periods of time that are to pass. And the reason for the passing of that time is for something to be known. Now I'm gonna ask you a favor this morning. I'm gonna ask you to still love me when this is over, all right? I may have to ask you several times how you're doing with that. Because the message that the angel delivers is the most difficult message you will ever, ever embrace in your life. It is something we squirm and wrestle against. It is something that we do not want to admit to. The angel says there are seven periods of time, whether that's seven weeks or seven months, seven years, we don't really know what it is, but it's seven is a number of completion. There's a period of time that is foreknown and the purpose of that time is to bring about the understanding that the living may know 
that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, and he sets over it the lowliest of men. The theme of all of Daniel is that theme right there. That is the heartbeat of what Daniel's, all of Daniel's writing is telling us. That principle <coughs> is what this story is all about. There are no apologies made for that. There are no exceptions granted to that. It is that that this dream is to teach us. All mortals, that includes you and me, must know that God is God, and there is no other, and that God is unbridled in his rule and his power. I'm going to hold you to your promise to still love me when I'm done with this. Don't hurt the messenger. Right? When you deprive God of the quality of being the most high, then you have somehow deprived God of being God only with the acknowledgement that he is most high can you begin to understand what God is all about. That principle is haunting. So Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to come in and he asked Daniel to give the interpretation of the dream. Daniel hesitates. He understands what the dream is saying. But he pauses, and I don't know if his pause is because this is not good, and I gotta give this to the king, and if the king isn't happy, there's repercussions to me, kind of like the sermon today. Or perhaps it's with Daniel saying, out of respect to the king, I really don't wanna share this. Or maybe it's out of a deep sense of respect for God's purpose for authority. Because Daniel understands that the tree that gets cut down is the king himself. Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. Daniel says, it is you, O king, who's become so strong that your influence extends all the way to the heavens, all the way across the earth. Your beauty is unmatched. The fruit of what you've done is unsurpassed. All of humanity takes its shelter under your branches or rests within them. Then Daniel says, the decree that has been issued about the tree, you being lopped off, it is a decree that is inescapable. It is the Most High that chopped and locked and stripped and scattered the king so that the king will be driven from humanity in this world into the world of beasts. Daniel tells the king, you are the greatest king our world knows. Your influence is beyond belief. But the one who rules in heaven, the Most High God, is about to take you out. But he's not going to take your life. He's going to cut you down, and the stump is going to remain. And after a season, when you understand what he wants you to know, he will restore you back into your place of prominence and beauty. What I find fascinating about the story is Nebuchadnezzar is so haunted by the dream, he has to understand it, and now he understands it, and then the text sends us back into life. Nebuchadnezzar just goes back into his world, and nothing happens. The scriptures tell us that about a year later, about a year. Nebuchadnezzar forgets all about what was said to him. I told you last week, Nebuchadnezzar is us, fickle. He forgets, and he's hanging out in the palace, and life is good, and everything is happy, and he's standing in amazement of his kingdom. A year later. And he looks around, and he becomes entranced and entrenched upon his own pride. He says, look at the great Babylon that I have built <coughs> through my mighty power for the glory of my majesty. Boom! 
he is immediately smitten and he's driven from mankind and there it is said that he is there until he knows very same phrase but now it's personalized to Nebuchadnezzar until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. I find the source of events, the sequence of events, fascinating. It's so much like us. You know, it, 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 it reminds me like you get a health scare, you go to the doctor, something's wrong and something significant has to take place in order to fix it. And so all of a sudden you get your act together, you eat right, you exercise, you look after yourself. Then over a period of time, and then boom. We're like that. Nebuchadnezzar was no exception. As he's standing in amazement of who he is and what he is and what he's done, he is visited from the watcher from heaven. And he says that this will last the state of being debased will last until you know that God rules in heaven. What consists of understanding the God who this passage is about? What is it that we need to know that makes God the sovereign God? or the Most High God? What is it that Nebuchadnezzar needs to understand? I think Nebuchadnezzar is out in the, in the wilderness. He, he, he is transformed literally from a, not, not only the most supreme human, but not, and not just some poor or needy person. He's transformed below all of that. He's lost his reason. He loses his mind. In some sense, he's no longer human. And he has to know something. At the end of this time, he comes to his senses, and the scriptures say that his reason returns to him, and he makes a profession. And I suggest to you this morning that these five professions that he makes are statements that you and I need to understand if we are to understand who the Most High Sovereign God is. The first thing he announces when he comes to his senses is that God's dominion is an everlasting dominion. He can look around and see with pride everything he's done, but he understands that compared to God, he is nothing. God's dominion is an everlasting dominion. He may have thought his dominion was, but he understands only God's dominion, God's kingdom endures throughout generations that this kingdom it continues to endure long after other kings kingdoms are gone and then comes the most powerful phrase of all you promise to love me the inhabitants of the earth are accounted for nothing Let that sink in just for a second. The inhabitants of the earth account for nothing. One of the distortions that's taken place in the gospel in our day and time has been the diminishing of God and the elevation of people. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar that this thing is about to make you understand who God is and in Nebuchadnezzar's understanding, he understands that we are nothing compared to God. That God surpasses everything that we imagine our own importance to be. That God considers us to be whatever, but we must consider that God is so far greater that we exist as nothing. You say, well, that's really harsh because the scriptures tell us that he's our heavenly father. He knows the hairs of our head, he, whatever. You can't start there. You have to start here. 
And so that when you get to those statements about Jesus saying your life is precious because God loves you so much, that you understand that's not the starting point. That, when you understand that, compared to where you started, now you begin to understand grace. Whatever good you think you have, whatever importance or prominence you think you have in this universe, it is owed to you by the grace of God. I liken it to this, it's kind of an interesting thing. We think that our earth is so amazing, but we're just one little planet in the midst of an amazing galaxy. I don't know, hundreds of millions of light years across it. And our galaxy is one of the littlest galaxies among a universe of galaxies. When you look at the earth, you aren't even looking at a drawer in your kitchen cabinet compared to the house. And then when we think of our own lives, how important that is, we are just one person in the midst of billions of people existing on this tiny little planet in the midst of an amazing universe. The inhabitants of this world are counted for nothing. He does according to his will in heaven and earth. God does whatsoever God wants to do. There's nobody that tells him you can't do this or you can't do that. He does whatever he wants. And finally, no, none, no one can stay his hand or question his work. No one has the right to stand before God and shake their fist and say, what is it that you're doing to me? What is going on here? The God that Nebuchadnezzar is to understand in order for his reason to be returned is God established in those five statements. They affirm God's sovereignty. They affirm that he is the most high God. And once he admits to those, the scriptures are very clear. His reason, his humanness, the purpose for which he was created, the way he is to be, now is restored to his person. He literally becomes born again. What can we learn? What is it that you and I need to glean from this? What are the teachable points? How can we take it from this kind of gloomy dream world that is played out upon Nebuchadnezzar in a world far away? How can we make sense of it in ours? First of all, the earthly king that no power could stop, the greatest king in the, going on in that era, is reduced to the basis of human beings by the Most High God. No matter how powerful you think people are out here in our world, there is a God who is greater. If there was ever a time in our world when we need to know that, it is now, in this season of our world's existence. God is greater than all of that, in spite of what we can see or can't see. God is ultimately in control and our lives are in his hands. Anybody who's been through any of the addiction programs understands that that is the bedrock for getting out of the bondage, understanding that there is a supreme power, the supreme power is God, and that God controls things, and my life is in his hands. And it's about teaching me to let go, know what I can do, and be at peace with the things that I don't have control over. It is the essence of human reason. It is what makes us fully human. It is what restores us into being healthy. The second thing we learn from this is very important. Human devotion to and recognition of God must be constantly nurtured. Nebuchadnezzar's trouble. He gets the interpretation of the dream. And then he goes back to life until all of a sudden he has fallen into pride. Your devotion to God cannot exist apart from being nurtured. 
One of the reasons why weekly worship is so important. Jesus said, if you are abiding in my word and my word is abiding in you, ongoing, then you'll be my disciple and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. We are people that are constantly in need of instruction. Think of it this way. Uh, Rob and Heather have young men that they're raising. They're so good at raising young men, they're going to have another one. I'm convinced as a family, you tell your sons once not to do something and they never do it from that point on, right? <laughs> or you tell them to do something, they do it from that point on, don't they? They're in constant need of what? Reminders, constant need of nurturing, constant need of reinforcing, constant need of being reminded that this is how we do things. This is what's important. This is how we act. This is what we want to be. We as human beings are constantly in need of being nurtured because pride and indifference always moves us away from God. The path that we are on, the track that we take, always moves us in a God-less direction, away from God. And it is only the constant contact with spiritual things that keeps us where we're supposed to be. And finally, fully healthy human reason can only exist when one accepts God's sovereignty without conditions. The great thing introduced in the Christian faith, you all love me, I know, the great thing that's been introduced in the Christian faith that has stripped God of his sovereignty is our adamant refusal to let go of the idea of free will. God is this sovereign, powerful God, but he can't do if you won't let him. Ask Nebuchadnezzar that. Ask him how he thinks about that. This lesson tells us that God is greater than anything. God does what he wants. God is the most high God. And we must have that firmly planted in our hearts and minds so that the blessings that we receive and the things that we do and, 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 and that which you get to enjoy is received as a gift, a celebration of God's goodness and grace. Unhealthy, unconverted human nature rigidly seeks ways to maintain control of their lives. I submit that one of the most difficult things you and I ever have to learn is how to let go of the control of our lives. Nobody here likes to be under the spell of a controlling person. But everyone here, to some degree, is a controlling person. Why was this story included in the text? Why of all of the thousands of things that could have been written, was this story written? Because we need to know that God is the most high God. He rules the affairs of our world. And that there is nothing, no one, that can thwart his plans. That we are accounted for nothing. There's none that can even question what he does. Our God is the great God. If he is not that, then we are serving the wrong God. Would you bow your heads with me? For just a moment, I want you to think with me and center your hearts upon the idea of who God is. The Most High God. The God who exists above and beyond. The one to whom all glory and all honor is due. Would you just for a moment ask yourself, do I acknowledge that God? Is that the God that I focus my life and my world upon? And do I understand that all of the good things that I expect all of the love that I receive, all of the things that happen are simply gifts of His grace and His mercy. Father, help us to see that. In Jesus' name, amen.
you stand, remain standing and join with me in our prayer of thanksgiving? Gracious God, we thank you for such wealth and blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lead us to respond to all you have given with gratitude and joy. We bring our gift of money to honor you and serve others in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Ask our ushers to go ahead and serve our congregation at this time. seated. It is now time for us to go before our God with prayers on behalf of those who are struggling, maybe friends of yours or family, perhaps something in your own life, that we take to the Most High God, knowing that He hears us and that He answers our prayers. In addition to that, we have uh, those who are listed in the bulletin and those that might be on your hearts. We have requests for traveling mercies for those who are on the road this holiday weekend. Prayers for Dick Cobb, who is in the hospital, the Martinez family, and the Degler family. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to approach your throne. The Most High God, the ruler of heaven and earth, the one who rules the affairs of all things, we have the privilege going before with confidence through the blood, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers. We lift up before you those who are struggling, those who we know, those who we love. We lift up before you those things in life that we yield over to you and ask you now to minister to. Father, in addition to these, we lift up before you Dick Cobb, the Martinez family, the Degler family, 
We lift before you those who are traveling, seeing loved ones, spending time together. We lift before you, Father, all who rule, all who have positions of authority in our world. Pray for them, knowing, Father, that they represent your ultimate plans and purposes in our world as you bring all things to conclusion and you bring to us the evidence of your kingdom in a world that has been restored and remade. Lord, we pray for all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Receive the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May you know that the Most High God is your God and that the promises made to you in Christ Jesus are backed by the character and quality of that God. Go in peace, for we are. Amen.